I want to briefly mention that much of this work is also the work of Todd Morgan, who was a fellow at our institution uh, and who recently took a job at the University of Michigan. So by way of introduction, um, this is actually not a new concept. The, the idea that a patient's preoperative nutritional status impacts outcome has actually been studied for 20 to 30 years in general surgery and in other contexts. Um, and it's been shown repeatedly that across a variety of different, particularly GI malignancies, um, that poor nutritional status does predict outcome. Um, and the individual elements that we actually ultimately ended up using in our study have all either individually or collectively previously been associated with worth outcomes after cancer surgery uh, in general. But surprisingly, uh, this has never been specifically addressed in the context of kidney cancer. And particularly since nutritional status is something you can potentially impact on before surgery, we thought it was warranted to look at this uh, in this particular context. So in order to do that, we did a single institution retrospective cohort study. This was of 369 consecutive patients, all treated at Vanderbilt University, who underwent either a radical or partial nephrectomy for local regional uh, renal cell carcinoma. So importantly, uh, we excluded anybody who had known metastatic disease. So this, uh, but we did allow for lymph node positive or direct extension, direct extension into the adrenal gland, provided it was surgically removed at the time of surgery. All these surgeries were performed in a five-year interval from 2003 to 2008. Our primary outcome of interest was the disease-specific survival and overall survival. And we uh, used three indices for nutritional status. And the reason these three were chosen was specifically because um, they are objective and we could readily assess them in using this particular retrospective approach. They included an albumin below the upper limits uh, or the lower limits of normal, excuse me, at our institution, a BMI that was below 18.5, and weight loss of 5%, less than uh, at least 5% um, in the six months preceding the surgery. We performed univariate analysis, and for multivariate analysis, <coughs> we used the Cox proportional hazard approach. So, for our results. The median age for this group, uh, not surprisingly, was 61 years old. The median follow-up was relatively short, 22 months, the interquartile range you can see there. The median uh, follow-up for surviving patients was 24 months. And these are the nutritional parameters for these surgical patients. So you can see that approximately 5%, 20 patients, had an albumin that was below 3.5. A low number, only six, had a BMI less than 18.5. Uh, you will note, however, that in the United States, uh, unfortunately, many patients uh, are hypernutrition, if you will. Uh, the uh, number who had a normal BMI was, I think, 23%. So this study was not done in Vienna. This was done in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, roughly three quarters of these patients are overweight. Um, approximately 17% uh, total had weight loss of at least 5% or more preceding the months uh, to surgery. And therefore, roughly a quarter, which is a surprisingly large number if you think about it, met at least one of the criteria to be nutritionally deficient. Uh, you can see the breakdown there, 5% by albumin, 1.5% by um, BMI, and 17% by weight loss. Interestingly, only seven patients had two factors, and none of them had all three. So the first thing we did was to see what the big differences were between the nutritionally deficient group and the nutritionally replete group. There's a lot of numbers on here, so let me direct your attention to two areas. One, the nutritionally deficient patients tended to be older. And two, they tended or they had a higher probability of being anemic. It did not have anything to do apparently between male or female, nor with Charleston comorbidity index, which was a measure of their morbidities prior to surgery. If we look at their pathologic features, uh, and all digs against the TNM system aside, it's kind of what uh, I had to use at the time. Um, 
you will note that the T stage tended to be higher for the nutritionally deficient patients. They tended to have higher grade, but the other parameters, at least statistically, were similar. In our particular study, there were 61 all-cause deaths, 11% were in the control group, 36% in the nutritionally deficient group. There were 26 disease-specific deaths, 3.5% in the control group, 19% in the nutritionally deficient group. And on, uh, by Kaplan-Meier and log rank analysis, the estimated three-year actuarial survival in controls was 86% versus only 59% nutritionally deficient. You can see that uh, graphically depicted on the right on the Kaplan-Meier curve, and that difference was statistically significant. You can see the unit of variant analyses uh, to, to the left there. Um, on multivariate analysis, importantly, after controlling for age, comorbidity index, stage, nodal status, grade, and anemia, with that, nutritionally deficient was still an independent predictor of outcome. And in fact, it was a very, um, very important one. These people were at least two and a half fold more likely to die postoperatively, even controlling for all these other co -found, um, covariates. For disease-specific survival, the estimates in the controls was 95% at three years versus nutritionally deficient 80%. Again, you can see that graphically depicted on the other side. Again, this was statistically significant. And on multivariate analysis, again, accounting simultaneously for age, comorbidity, stage, nodal status, grade, and anemia, nutritionally deficiency was still an independent predictor of outcome, and a, and a very strong one. Again, these people were almost three times more likely to die of their disease than those who had a normal nutritional status. So, this has been, this is not necessarily a novel concept. In other settings, esophageal cancer, colorectal cancer, other GI malignancies, even in just major GI surgery in general, nutritional status has a very strong association with worse outcome. And our group actually has already published this is also true in bladder cancer. So almost any major cancer surgery, it appears that nutritional status is important. Surprisingly, despite that, this had never been addressed previously for surgery in the context of kidney cancer specifically, and these types of parameters are not currently used in any of our predictive models. One of the reasons may be uh, that there is no clearly agreed upon uh, strategy for how to rank these people in regards to their nutritional status. Um, there are actually multiple different systems out there, none of them standardized. Um, we sought to in include one that had specifically just objective measures, and we think uh, that the parameters we used have an advantage uh, for that reason. The other systems out there include both objective and subjective measures. None of them are validated, and none of them, unfortunately, have any widespread consensus. There's at least two worth mentioning. One is the nutritional risk screening, uh, and you'll note that its elements on there include something called food intake, which would require you to actually get a sense of their specific caloric intake prior to surgery, which is somewhat cumbersome. Similarly, one that's been used actually in some randomized prospective trials previously in other contexts is the subjective global assessment. Again, it includes subjective parameters, including having to assess someone's food intake. So we sought specifically to use three objective values, the serum albumin, the BMI, and a measure of weight loss itself. And having done that, we found that 23%, a actually shockingly high number once we had done it, were nutritionally deficient prior to surgery, and that this was associated with worse survival. But importantly, this is potentially modifiable. So at this point, this is a testable hypothesis, and it would be that were you to define these people in advance and actually intervene in some way, either through maybe a short-term preoperative admission with TPN or some other uh, intervention of the sort, could you improve outcome? This I present only as a hypothesis at this point, but it's a testable one. Um, I want to briefly mention some of our limitations. Our follow-up is admittedly somewhat short. This is a retrospective design and therefore has all the uh, associated problems with a retrospective design. And again, there's no established set criteria for nutritional status. We are proposing only one and there may be others. 
But in conclusion, a large proportion, 23% of patients undergoing nephrectomy for renal cell carcinoma are nutritionally deficient. This is independently associated with a significant decrease in survival. Some consideration of a nutritional intervention may be appropriate in these individuals, which I put forth as a testable hypothesis. And therefore, further prospective studies are needed to confirm these results and evaluate the impact of an actual intervention on outcomes. Thank you.